together and without fear, without any kind of oppression. And so God, we just thank you for that amazing privilege. We are here for you to worship you, to praise you, to thank you, and to ask for your guidance in the days ahead, Lord. Some of us come with heavy burdens, and, and we lift those up to you, Lord. Yes, yes. 
Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. I will praise our Lord to give us such a beautiful morning. And thank you for coming here for worship. Now, I'm going to announce the upcoming events in our church. The first one is today is convalescent ministry. Join us from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. at York Health Care and Wallace Center, Highland Park. Please, please see Liz Awuso if you are interested. 第一件事情是康复院的施工 Park the York, York Today new members class at 9 to 9.45 a.m. We will meet upstairs in Adana Jishi building. If interested, the sign up sheet is in the fellowship hall. Remember, dates are the 16th and 23rd to complete classes. Uh,第二件事是新成员的新成员学习班时间是九点到九点四十五。今天已经开始了。Uh,请记住还有两次,也就是十六号到二十三号完成这个整个课程的学习。uh, next one is Homeless Ministry, Wednesday, June 12, 2019. Join us from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at the Union Rescue Mission in downtown Los Angeles. See Ernest Haley if you are interested. Uh, uh, next one is Father's Day, June the 17th, 2019. Men of all ages are invited to join us for a message for instruction, wisdom, and direction for your marriage, family, work life, and work with the Lord. Don't miss this opportunity to learn about men of Avena. 下面一件事情是父亲节特别举行的，嗯，特别举行的活动，请大家所有的男士，不管什么年纪，都欢迎参加这一个讯息的学习，做一个有勇气的男子汉。Now uh, next one is the Amazon Amazon Smile Donation. If you do not, if you do your Amazon shopping online, a donation will be issued to our church. You can support. South Pasadena Christian Church by going to smile.amazon.com. Uh, smile.amazon.com. Uh, now, the last one, Agape boxes. Agape boxes are located in the rear of the church. So, uh, on left and, and on left and also on right and in the middle of the church, so you can see the boxes. Now, uh, uh, please, now uh, please, now uh, give your of tithes and the offerings in the box, and uh, we are, we are very appreciative for your offering. Now,最后一件事就是奉献箱，奉献箱安装在我们教会的。教会大堂的两侧和中间的门的上面，请大家把自己的奉献投递到盒子里面去。我非常感谢大家的奉献。Now, uh, thank you very much. Now, let's. It's the time to acknowledge our first-time visitors. If this is the first time uh, visiting with us this morning, please stand and uh, tell us your name and uh, who invited you. We don't want to embarrass you, but we really want to know you. 下面是欢迎我们第一次到教会来访问的兄弟姊妹。如果是第一次，请你站起来，告诉我们你的名字，你谁邀请你来的？ Okay, now, okay, we see a um, uh, young man, very young. Man. Uh, I'm Trevor.
praise the Lord. Oh, that sounds like scattered applause. Can we give the Lord a great praise the Lord? What a joy it is to be with you on this glorious day. How many of you would agree with that? What a glorious day uh, it is today. I heard somebody say California weather. I think that was Sandra. Uh, and she is so right. I think um, uh, most of us, that's why we were here. Reminds me of my 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 relative, my aunts and uncles. Years ago, I was considering moving to the south, which is where we, my family, came from. And uh, there was so much resistance from my family. No, we don't want to move back there. We brought you to California because this is where you want to be. And I was like, okay, well, I'll consider that. But yes, really beautiful here. I'm glad to look out and see all of your faces this morning. I want to uh, especially say hello to Bob, who is visiting with us. I understand the second time Bob was here uh, the week that I was out of town. Good to see you, Bob. Uh, also good to see Ching. Where was she? Oh, there she is. Ching was uh, brought by a friend uh, or brought, brought by a member of our church. Uh, we're so grateful to see her this morning. I want to make sure that uh, John, and maybe, maybe, maybe Finney, you can help with this, that everyone who needs a translation device has one. I know Ching may need one, uh, so if we can make sure those are spread out. Uh, also want to say hello to Trevor, uh, visiting with us this morning. Uh, and of course, to all of you. As we uh, approach Father's Day, um, I want to just echo the announcement that uh, we are expecting that all men, young and old, will be uh, in our company for that day. I really believe that the Lord will bless your heart uh, in that day. A message God has given me, I think, will encourage you not only in your roles as husbands, but particularly uh, in your roles as spiritual heads of your households and all uh, that that entails. So I'm really looking forward to that day. Invite your family and friends uh, out for that day uh, as well. It will be a great time in the Lord. How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but uh, two of our uh, announcers thus far that have come have reminded us, well, I, I guess it was our praise team leader, uh, as well as Sandra, reminded us of the religious freedom that we have in our country to uh, worship God. And uh, that is something that oftentimes we take for granted, but this morning we do, and we are grateful for the privilege to worship God openly, openly and freely. Uh, I believe this message will bless you today. How many of you know that in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus tells us, he says, watch out. He says, be on guard against all kinds of greed. He says, you have to be careful and be watchful because your life does not consist in the abundance of the things that you possess. And even though most of us are familiar with that text and we know that intrinsically to be true, nevertheless, at times, it is difficult to resist the temptation to believe that if I just had a little more money, if, 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 I, if my living circumstances were just a little better, if I maybe saved just a little more for my retirement, many of us would say, if I could just hit the lottery, yes. I know my life would be better. You know, it's, it's interesting, though, that research on motivation has shown unequivocally that we're not driven or motivated by external things like money or, 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 or physical things. Our motivation comes from within, and oftentimes it's based on feelings. Money is just a means to an end 
to things that bring us good feelings, things that make us feel good about ourselves and our accomplishments. But ultimately, motivation is internal. So what motivates you? You think about motivation. What motivates you to get up in the morning? What motivates you to pursue another day? God. Somebody said God. Well, that's an especially important question when you consider that Jesus tells us that it is to his Father's glory that we bear much fruit. And that bearing fruit is a sign that shows that we are his disciple. Jesus wants you to have a passion for life. Jesus wants you to be driven in what you do. And today, we're going to see that God has given us an eternal system of motivation that if we will yield to, we will recognize its value, we will be driven to live a fulfilled life. Amen? How many of you like to have a fulfilled life? To know that your life means something. Hallelujah. I believe that's most of us. But I can pray where we are on this prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather in your presence. Lord, we thank you for our time of fellowship. We thank you for the meal that we will share. We thank you for all of our friends. But mostly, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence and to have you speak to our hearts. So, Lord, we pray now that you would set aside any of those things that may distract us, that you would open our hearts and open our ears, that we may receive your word, and that it may produce a hundredfold return in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 So, have you ever thought about what is the most valuable thing that God has given us? What is the most valuable gift that God has given us? And if we think about it, the answer unequivocally comes back as being faith. The greatest gift that God has given us is the gift of faith because it is through faith that we are saved. And that salvation, that faith, is a gift from God. Now the Bible says God has given every man, every woman, a measure of faith. He's given every single one of us a measure of faith. And he expects us to multiply that faith according to each of our abilities. God expects you to do something with the faith that he has given you. Now Galatians 5, 6 tells us that this faith that is a gift from God, it's a faith that works by love. How do you know you have a saving faith? How do you know you have the faith that Jesus comes to be the author and the finisher of in your life? How do you know you have that faith? Faith, you know you have that faith. Because you have a propensity to love the way God loves. How do you know you have faith? Because you love the way Jesus loves. Jesus is the author and finisher of a faith that works by love. Now, it is by the work of faith, which is the work of love, that we increase our fruitfulness. And we're going to see clearly in this text what God means by increasing our fruitfulness. The more we love the way Jesus loves, the more fruit we produce in our lives. The more we love the way Jesus loves, the more joy the more peace, the more goodness, the more kindness, the more faithfulness, the more humility, the more patience, and the more self-control we will 
experience. Now the motivation that God has given us is a motivation that comes from the fruit of the Spirit. God's Spirit resting on us and in us provides the motivation to pursue the things in life that will bring us ultimate fulfillment. It is our desire for more fruit in life that should be our motivation, our drive. The litmus test for us as believers won't be our possessions. The litmus test for us as believers will be our fruitfulness. When we stand before Jesus, he will be looking in us to see what we have done with the faith that he gave us. Did we multiply to the kingdom, to the glory of his kingdom? Or did we bury it like, the, like the, the servant who buried his talent. Did we bury it and will come before him with nothing to show for our faith? The Bible says some of us on that day will have a hundredfold return, some 60 and some 30. The key to living a fulfilled life is recognizing the value of pursuing fruit. So how do we increase the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? How do we get more of what the Bible says should be the motivation for our lives? How do we get more fruit? We increase our fruit by increasing our love. I want you to see in this text what Jesus gives us as being the key to pursuing or increasing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. A fulfilled life is a life in pursuit of the fruit of the Spirit. That should be our internal motivation for when we wake up in the morning to want to pursue that day is knowing that today I have an opportunity to increase my love, my joy, my peace. I'm going to do those things that grow the fruit of the Spirit in my life. It's interesting, if you think about a farmer that wants to increase his or her harvest, what do they have to do? They have to increase their efforts in the work of farming. And so if we want to increase the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we have to do more of the work of the Spirit, which is how we produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We have to do more of the things that Jesus does. And so Jesus gives us the key then to the pursuit of a fruitful life here in our text. The very first thing he says is here in verse 24. He says, Very truly I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The hallmark of Christian love is that it is sacrificial. What we can say about the love of Jesus unquestionably is that Jesus had a sacrificial love. Paul says God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Three times the Bible says Jesus went to the Father and he cried, Father, is there any other way that man can be saved? Let this cup pass. Three times the Bible says he earnestly prayed that. And God was silent. And his silence was indicative of the fact that in order for God to increase in our lives, we must decrease. There's no other way that we can make ourselves more useful to God without the explicit knowledge 
that in order for him to do more in me, I have to become less in order for him to become more. In other words, I have to be willing to think on the things of God more than I think on those things that simply pertain to me and my life. When it comes to learning to love the way Jesus loves, the biggest battle we face is learning how to consider the needs of others before our own. That's the kind of love that Jesus demonstrates for us. But if we consume the seed that God has given us on ourselves, then we won't be able to spread God's love and to, and to bring God's love into the life of others because we've exhausted it on ourselves. Listen, we have to believe by faith that even though we are looking out for the needs of others, God will take care of our needs in the same way that a farmer knows that when she sows her seed into the ground, it will produce a harvest. That's the kind of confidence we have to have when it comes to loving people sacrificially the way God loves us. And then we see another important point to increasing God's fruit in our lives here in verse 25 of our text. The reason is as follows. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Or anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. In other words, we must be in this world, but not of it. I know you maybe heard that before. I know I used to hear that long before. I understood it. What does it mean to be in the world, but not of the world? It doesn't mean that our homes will be different. We live in different houses. It doesn't mean that our cars will be different from people in the world. It doesn't mean that our clothes will be different from people in the world. You can't tell whether someone is a Christian by where they, where they live or what they drive what they wear. You will know that someone is a Christian by their love. And saints, this is what it has to distinguish us from the world. We are in the world to love, but our love is not from this world. Can I share that with you again? We are in this world to love. God put us here to love, but the love that we share is not a love that is of this world. You see, the world loves those who love them. It's reciprocal. I love you, you love me. If you don't love me, I don't love you. But God calls us to a love that we even extend to our enemies. And especially to those who are different from us. And so it is that brand of love that distinguishes us from those who are in the world. And it is precisely, precisely in that way that we are in the world, but not of it. It is our love as Christians that distinguishes us from those who are in the world. And then finally, saints, and most importantly, in our final verse here, Jesus continues with what we need to do in order to have a fruitful life, a fulfilled life, in verse 26. He says, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. And saints very clearly in that passage, what Jesus is expressing to us is that worship of God is inseparable from serving God. We cannot separate worship and service. If you are worshiping God, you are serving God. 
If you serve God, you worship God. That's why when the enemy was tempting Jesus in the wilderness and he, and he, and he tempted Jesus to bow down and to worship him, Jesus' response was, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You determine what you worship by what you serve, where you spend your time, where you spend your energy, what is your main focus in life. It is through those things that we determine what is most valuable to us, what is most important to us. Jesus says, whoever serves me must follow me. And there's no exception to that rule. And as we think about the call to discipleship, we know that it is intrinsic, that we see it in the instructions here in our text. The first thing we understand is that not my will, but thy will be done. Then we understand that we need to be willing to make whatever sacrifice God calls us to make in doing his will his will being done in our lives. Those are the first two conditions of discipleship. And then lastly, Jesus says, follow me. And without exception, if you are following Jesus, he leads you into the harvest. It is in the harvest that we will be shaped and pruned and we will be recreated in his image. And so Jesus says, if you serve me, then you will follow me. You will follow me into the harvest where the fruit is plentiful but those willing to labor for it are fruit, are few. The key to living a fulfilled life is living a fruitful life. We increase our fruitfulness by increasing our love. Amen? Amen. Amen. You've got a hand praise in the house of